Shalom, everybody. Welcome to this week's Journey Through Torah. This week we are in Vayechel. We're coming towards the end of this book, Shemot. And uh, as we've learned, this book is Yahweh is revealing himself to his people. He's revealing himself as he wants us to know him, as one who redeems, as one who heals, as one who restores, uh, one who desires relationship. And, and we're seeing all of this come to pass in Build me a place for me to dwell with you, for me to be with you, to be among you, and all of this we have some responsibility to do. So we learned that when Moshe was on the mountain, he was receiving the instructions from Yahweh, he was telling him how to prepare the place, and he relayed the message to the people, and then the, the people were excited about the building. They wanted to do this. They wanted to make sure Yahweh was in their midst, that they, uh, wherever they went, that he would be with them. And, and they wanted to have the means to worship and have this relationship. So they have to carry the tabernacle with them. But first off, they have to get it built. And in order to build it, they have to know what it looks like, what its functions are. Uh, everything comes into play here. There's a lot to learn. But there are some important things we learn in this parsha along the way. It's not just about the specifics of the physical things. There has to be the emphasis on the spiritual side of it. The physical is here to relate to us concepts, but the spiritual is the reality. And so we have to look at how these two things come, come to pass. We're going to see some of that in this week's Parsha. So we can say, well, we live in the physical world, you're right, but we live for the spiritual world. We live for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of the things that are eternal, not the, not the things that are temporal and right here. All right. So how does this come to play in this week? Let's take a look at it. So we start off in Exodus 35, 1 to 38, 20 is the Parsha for this week. Let's look at 35.1. It says, uh, Moshe assembled all the congregation of B'nai Israel, and he said to them, These are the words which Adonai has commanded you to do. Work is to be done for six days, but the seventh day is a holy day for you, a Shabbat of complete rest to Adonai. Whoever does any work then will die. Do not kindle a fire in any of your dwellings on Yom Shabbat, on, on the day of Shabbat. So the first thing we look at, is Vayekhel. Vayekhel is an assembling together. So who were assembled for the instructions of preparing a place to dwell? Who were assembled here? The whole congregation of the people of Israel. All of the people of Israel. We read Vayekhel Moshe et kol edat b'nei Israel. The whole community of the sons of Israel. All of Israel is how this reads. All of the community. All right, so they all came together. And why this time? Why now? And I'm, I believe this is a matter of refocusing. Remember, we just went through the, the golden calf. Moshe was up on the mountain, and uh, the people lost sight of, of what they needed to do, which was uh, wait here for me to come back to you. And as soon as they're like, well, he's been gone long enough. We don't know what's happened to him, so let's make a golden calf, right? So they lost focus. So here Moshe is coming down. He's relaying the instructions of Yahweh to the people, and he's refocusing them back toward Yahweh and his presence, Yahweh and his tabernacle, a place for uh, all the people to come together as a shared purpose, uh, as, as one people to serve Yahweh. Remember, because they lost focus, they lost sight of what was important, and, and they went to do their own thing. And here Moshe is bringing them back into a place of Okay, guys, we need to build this place for Yahweh to dwell with us. We don't want golden calves to go before us. We want the presence of the Most High. We want the presence of the one who redeemed you to go with you, right? And this is how it is to be done. So the first thing we see here is he had to assemble them all together. I mean, you're not going to get anything done if you don't get people together, right? And in classical Hebrew, there's three words that are that are given for community. Eda, Zibur, and Kehela. For Eda, it is a group with a collective identity. They have the same experiences. They have they're they're working towards the same purpose. In other words, these are like-minded people. Eda, it's, it's a it's a gathering uh, together. Uh, Zibur is a heap or a pile of something. It's a group formed by numbers rather than identity. They may have nothing in common other than just being at the same place at the same time. And then Kehela is people who are together for a shared activity. Each makes a contribution. Now, depending on the rest of the context, it could be positive or negative, but the idea is the people are gathering together for a common goal. 
It's a common purpose. And, and they're gathering together, which each individual has a role to play and has a, a part to be in that. And that's the word that's used here is, is Ve'ekel. Ve'ekel is, and he gathered together and, and he gave them the instructions for the Mishkan where they all have a role in that and it being with them and in their presence. But there's something important that happens here. As important as it was to build the tabernacle, as, as much as Yahweh says, I want you to build a place for me where I can dwell among you. And as much as the people wanted this to happen, there has to be some guidelines here. Don't get so busy in, in the physical building of the tabernacle that you forget the spiritual reason for why it's there in the first place. Okay, Don't, uh, there's, we can learn a lesson in here. Okay, because he says before they before they start to prepare the place for Yahweh to dwell, they have to prepare themselves first. That's what we're looking at. They have to prepare themselves and make sure that their hearts are equipped for the task at hand. They have to stop the physical work and the physical building to focus on the spiritual building of Shabbat. They have to focus on building his house, his place, his people, building relationship with him. That's done on Shabbat. Now, it's it's interesting when you say this, and I'm just going to throw this in there as a side note. I don't particularly like the word Sabbath. Um, there's nothing really wrong with it. It's just a word, okay? But my point is people use that as a as a means of me stopping what I'm doing for something else that I want to do, you know? Um, like example, you know, I'm going to take a sabbatical. means I'm just going to take a break, right? Shabbat is every seven days. The seventh day is Shabbat. See, and so there, there's a difference. You know, people say, well, my Sabbath is, no, it's Yahweh's Sabbath. It's his Sabbath. He established it. He named it. And then we come and honor him on that day. Okay. So it's not a matter of, well, this is what it means to me, or this is what I want to do with it. No, it, it's, it's what he wants to do with it. And we line up with that because we are a covenant people. We are a place for him to dwell, but because we are a place for him to dwell, that doesn't mean now we can just do whatever we want. Matter of fact, because we are a place for him to dwell, we should be that much more aware of our actions and our behaviors and, and how the things that we are saying and doing, how they affect Yahweh and his kingdom to be minded towards spiritual things, right? So here's some things regarding the, the Shabbat. In this passage, it says the seventh day is a holy day for you. So Shabbat was made for man, but it belongs to Yahweh. See that in Leviticus 19.30, it says you shall keep my Shabbats, my Sabbaths. That's not just one. It's all of them. You know, how many are there in a year? You know, there's, so all of them. And there are certain of the uh, Moedim that also have Shabbats in them as well. So he says, you are to keep my Sabbath and, and reverence my sanctuary. I am Yahweh. Ezekiel 20, 19 and 20 says, I am Adonai, your God. Walk in my statutes, keep my ordinances and do them. Keep my Shabbatot, my Sabbaths holy. So they will be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am Adonai, your God. Leviticus 23, 2 says, so speak to Ben Israel and tell them these are the appointed Moedim of Adonai, which you are to proclaim to be holy convocations, my Moedim. And then in verse 3, he goes and talks about a Shabbat. The very first of all of this is Shabbat. Okay, so Shabbat belongs to Yahweh. I mean, after all, he created it, right? And, uh, and so we enter into that day because we are his, which we'll learn a little more about that coming up here in just a minute. Now, uh, we may have heard where people will say, but Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. And they'll use this in a context of saying, we don't keep the Sabbath because he is the Lord of the Sabbath. That's not exactly correct, okay? He is the Lord of Shabbat. He created it. He is the Lord of it. But it doesn't mean that now we can do whatever we want to do on that day, okay? It doesn't mean he changed his mind on what is holy or that he changed his mind as far as he wants us to have relationship with him on that day, not focus on building our house, our kingdom, our ways, our jobs, th those things. We are focusing on building his kingdom, building our relationship with him and, and one another. These are the things that we're looking at and focusing on, on Shabbat, right? So it's not a matter if he came to change what it was as much as he came to change you. 
He came to change how we perceived and viewed the things that were there. He didn't, he didn't change his mind on his word. He just said, guys, you, you missed it and tried to draw our attention back to the purpose and the reality of it. Shabbat was always for a means of restoration and healing your soul, of coming into his presence and being made whole again every Shabbat. Let's look at, let's look at this in Matthew. Matthew 12, 1 through 13 is what we're going to read from. It says, At that time Yeshua went through the grain fields on Shabbat, and his disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck the heads of grain to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. Now, starting here, uh, in another passage, we see where they were plucking uh, grain to eat. They were eating, but they hadn't ritually washed their hands first. And Yeshua says, um, that's not the issue, guys. You don't have to do the ritual blessing in order to eat. Right. And in here, there's a difference between grabbing a handful of grain and just kind of rubbing it in your hand versus harvesting a field. OK, one is work and another is just lunch. OK, you're, you're not you're not creating this big job or this big task at hand. Your body needs to eat. <laughs> you know, you have to sustain yourself. And so that's what they were doing. They were hungry. They, they grabbed a couple pieces of, of grain. They rubbed it in their hands. They ate it. That's not work. They were just walking through. And that was permissible too, by the way, to do, to do that. It's not like they were stealing from somebody's field. Okay. So what's the issue really about what's really going on here? Let's keep reading. He said to them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry with those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and he ate the bread of presence, which is not lawful for him to eat or for those who were with him, but only for the priests. Or have you not read in the law how, how on Shabbat, the priests and the temple profane the Shabbat and they are guiltless? That's something that may, some people may have looked over. The priests, the Levites on Shabbat, they profane Shabbat, but they are guiltless. How can that be if he says all these things about keeping Shabbat and honoring Shabbat and doing all these things? Because guys, let's face it, when, the, when they made the offerings, that was work. There was a lot of work in that. And there were things that needed to be done on a daily basis. They had to carry the ashes out from the altar from the previous day. They had the offerings to make. Matter of fact, the Tamid offerings were double on Shabbat. They had to make the offerings that were there uh, even on Shabbat. Uh, they still burned incense. They still uh, had to do all these things. So they were still working. But here's the thing. Their work that was given was in the temple or in the tabernacle, and it was a mode of worship. They weren't doing their own thing, trying to build their own money uh, to set, to sustain their own homes. This was a mo manner of worshiping Yahweh and making sure that it was there so that the people could worship Yahweh. See? So again, what was really going on here? The priests profaned the Shabbat by working. Matter of fact, uh, in some, some areas, worship is called Avodah, which is work, right? The service on Yom Kippurim, it's called the Avodah, work. Okay, so again, sometimes that's what it is when we're looking at that. So here, the priests profane Shabbat, but they were guiltless in doing so because in order for the temple to function, in order for the tabernacle to function, they had to do that. But Yahweh didn't hold that against them. Other things we see in the scripture, it's like, uh, like on Yom Kippurim, by, by the one who offering, uh, by shedding of blood, you become unclean. The, the ashes of the red heifer, everyone involved in making the red heifer became unclean in the process. And then they, but then they would be uh, clean after a mikvah, right? So all of this comes in, in, in the play and how we approach him. Okay. The priestly duties, they were working, right? I mean, the, the, the teaching, the preaching, the sacrifices, the cooking that were there, the singing, the dancing, the performing on the musical instruments, the security that had to be there, right? All of this was involved in worship in the Mishkan, and it was all work, but they were blameless in doing so. So let's keep going. Verse 6, Matthew 12. So I tell you something greater than the temple is here. And if I had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. You would not have con condemned the guiltless for the son of man is the Lord of Shabbat. So he went on from there and he entered the synagogue, verse 10. And a man was there with a withered hand and they asked him, is it lawful to heal on Shabbat so that they might accuse him? See that? Oh, healing is work. This always amazed me. It's not a matter of, wow, he healed the guy. It's like, why is he doing it on the Sabbath? <laughs> Because what we learn is that it is good to do good on the Sabbath, right? 
uh, restoring and, and making whole and and doing this is is what the Shabbat was created for. Uh, so let's keep going. So, so he says to them, which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls in the pit on Shabbat, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Or how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And he said to them, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out and he was restored and it was healthy like the other. So again, what we have here is restoration being done on Shabbat. He says, even if you have a sheep that falls in a ditch, you'd pull it out of the ditch. You wouldn't sit there and let it starve or let it die or let it be in danger. Uh, if, if because it's on Shabbat, you would get it out. And this is one of the areas where they say preservation of life always uh, takes priority no matter what day of the week it is, because we're supposed to be restoring and bringing life, right? So does that mean because he wants to work restoratively, redemptively, and, and, and making us whole and healing us and bringing us into, I mean, all of this, which notice where were they? They were in the synagogue, right? Yeshua was in the synagogue here on Shabbat. So is all of this wrong? No, not at all. Uh, does this change what Shabbat is? No, not at all. Right? We even read in Hebrews 4, it says, So there remains a Shabbat rest for the people of God. For one who has entered God's rest has also ceased from his own work, just as God did from his. So let us, therefore, make every effort to enter that rest, so that no one may fall through the same pattern of disobedience. When we go through the cycles and, and on Shabbat, we stop our own agenda. And then we turn it towards Yahweh. That's a refreshing for us. That is a refocusing for us. That is causing us to, to stop the things that, that we see as important, which it is, but stop these things and understand the means of why we have these things in the first place. Everything we have is from Yahweh. Every, even our next breath, everything that we have, everything that we own, he gave you the ability and the know-how to do that. So, on the Shabbat, we stop all that and we turn our focus back to him. Now, beyond just the, the physical thing there, we also read about Shabbat that it is a sign and covenant. Now, what do we have to learn from this? What is the purpose of a sign? And here, verse 13, it says, so that you may know that I am Adonai who sanctifies you. We don't pursue our own ways, our own things. We set apart the day as holy with the intent of worship because he says, I am Yahweh who sanctifies you. You know, you may have heard it said, oh, you're, you're, you're trying to keep the Sabbath and do these things. Oh, you're trying to, 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 to be holier than thou, or you're trying to, to sanctify yourself kind of a thing. No, that's not it. It's not us that does that. Yahweh says he sanctifies you. He sets you apart. And he says, you keep Shabbat so that you will remember that. So that you remember you're not your own. You were redeemed. You belong to the Most High. You are in covenant with the one who created you. And, and it's a reminder week by week by week of that, that we surrender our own lives, hearts, and ways to enter into his. Okay. In Exodus 31, 13, we read of Shabbat, it says, Speak to B'nai Israel, saying, Surely you must keep my Shabbats, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generation, so that you may know that I am Adonai who sanctifies you. Therefore, you are to keep Shabbat, because it is holy for you. Notice, see, before he said it's holy for Yahweh, but now he says it's holy for you as well. Everyone who profanes it will die. If whoever does any work during Shabbat, the soul will be cut off from the midst of his people. Um, if we If we do not have covenant with Yahweh, then obviously we're going to be cut off. I don't, I don't think this is just a matter of, uh, you're going to be killed dead right here, right now, as much as it is you walk away from a place of covenant, right? This is a reminder you're in covenant. You serve him, right? Let's keep going. Verse 15 or verse 16, rather. So B'nai Israel is to keep Shabbat, to observe Shabbat throughout their generations as a what? Perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and B'nai Israel forever. For in six days, Adonai made the heaven and earth, and on the seventh day, he ceased from the work and he rested. That's just something, you know, Shabbat means a cease of work. It doesn't mean uh, just rest. It means stop creating, the stop of working. He stopped, see? So it's not just rest. And it's not a matter of, oh, I'm just going to stay in bed all day. No, because then you've also missed the point of Shabbat as well. Your body needs physical rest. Yes. But you're working on the six days. You're stopping on the seventh. You're stopping those physical things, but you are now edifying the spiritual things. 
again, looking to eternal things. So what we find here is that Shabbat is a sign for us, and it says it's eternal, and as such, it stands as a sanctuary in the midst of time, just like the Mishkan served as a sanctuary in the midst of space. The tabernacle, was, again, was a sanctuary in space. Shabbat is a sanctuary in time. The tent of meeting is Oha Moed, and the appointed times of Yahweh are Moedim, including Shabbat. So both were given were for a specific of appointments for Yahweh to meet with his people. Again, Ohel Moed is the tent of meeting. Shabbat is a Moed. It is a time of, of, of holy convocation to Yahweh. And a holy convocation was a public uh, assembly, a public gathering. So for the Mishkan, we see that it is a holy place with defined limits and borders. The Mishkan was to be holy and undefiled, and Israel was to prepare themselves before they entered it. And once you enter, you could expect to meet with Yahweh. On Shabbat, it is a holy time with defined borders. And we're told to prepare ourselves for Shabbat and keep it holy. Those entering Shabbat do so with the expectation of meeting with Yahweh. So see, there's a, it, it is a sanctuary from the rest of the week for us as well. So when we see here in Exodus 35, 3, we continue, it says, don't kindle a fire on any of your dwellings on Yom Shabbat, on the day of Shabbat. Uh, does this literally mean don't start a literal physical fire? I mean, it's what it says. It doesn't really tell us why, does it? Uh, and, you know, you can speculate and we can make reasons. We can do that. Oh, it was a lot of work to build a fire back then kind of stuff, you know. But he just says, don't kindle a fire on Shabbat. So there's that. And I'll let you midrash that out to see how you want to how, how you want to deal with that. But um, I, I think this has a dual meaning as well. I think this means within you as well, not to kindle a fire. Uh, anger is often related with fire something that burns within you you read through the scripture you talk about you see anger and you see burning uh used synonymously and, and used together right so I, I believe this works this way as well not to carry anger on shabbat not to stir up strife on shabbat when we get together it's not a time to argue and fight with one another it's a time for unity you know, if we have uh, disagreements and different things that are going on, we need to deal with that in the days of the week when we approach these things as they happen. Shabbat is a time for joy, a time for peace, a time for comfort, a time for rest, right? Uh, Proverbs 29, 22 says, a man of wrath stirs up strife and one given to anger causes much transgression. And you're not supposed to be doing that on Shabbat. Galatians 5, 13 and 14 says, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not let you, do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbors yourself. See that? Again, this is this is like Shabbat. On Shabbat, we don't do our own things, but we learn to love Yahweh and love one another. Titus 3 9 says, Avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division after warning him once and twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinfully self condemned. That's like any time, but even more so on Shabbat. Okay. Proverbs 6 6, uh, 6 16 Six things the Lord hates, seven are an abomination to him haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that uh, make hate haste to run to do evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among the brothers. And Matthew 5, 9 says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. See that? So again, uh, these things are just, you know, general times and general instructions, but again, even more so on Shabbat. Okay. Uh, Jeremiah 17, 21 says, tell the people that if they love their lives, they must not carry any load on Shabbat or not carry. This is talking about like carrying in heavy loads into the thing. Uh, keep in mind, a lot of times we see in the scripture too, where people would carry things in, they would want to sell things on Shabbat and you didn't do that either, right? This wasn't a time for that. You could do that on the six days. But here I think again, dual meaning. You know, dual meaning. They're not to carry any load, which also translates as burden on the Shabbat. They must not carry anything in through the gates of Yerushalayim. Why? Because that's where they would go up to worship or carry anything out of their houses on Shabbat. They must not work on Shabbat. They must observe it as a sacred day as I commanded their ancestors. Verse 23. Their ancestors did not listen to me or pay any attention. Instead, they became stubborn. They would not obey me or learn from me. Tell these people that they must obey all my commands. They must not carry any load in through the gates of the city on Shabbat. They must observe Shabbat as a sacred day and must not do any work at all. See that? So Shabbat is a time to stop our things and focus on kingdom things. 
Okay, it's a time to focus on, again, Yahweh, building his people, building community, reinforcing covenant, all of these things. Shabbat is a time for good. It's a time for rest, a time for worship, a time for gathering, time for healing, restoration, and connection. So do we look for ways to worship and glorify the name of Yahweh on Shabbat, or do we continue to follow our own desires and do our own things? I just had a really busy week, so I just want to go take a break for myself, right? Is that what Shabbat is for? No, that's not what Shabbat is for. Granted, we all need breaks, okay? We need that, and not saying you can't do that. But Shabbat, that was a different time to refocus. It's not a matter of, well, I worked all week to do the things that I think that I need to do here here now in the, in the physical, so I'm going to take some time off and do what I want. That's not what it was. Again, do our desires line up with Yahweh's desires? Does our heart line up with his heart? See, our, do we take delight in the things that he says we should be doing? Okay, that's an issue of the heart. Isaiah puts it this way. If you hold back your foot on Shabbat from pursuing your own interests on my holy day. See that? It says, if you hold back your foot on Shabbat. Um, Many translations say this many different ways, but this is really saying, if because of the Sabbath, you turn your foot away from your desires, you turn your foot away from the things you want to do, and you focus on my holy day, how do we do that? By, by not pursuing your own interest on my holy day. If you call Shabbat a delight, if you don't love Yahweh, Shabbat's not going to be a delight. If you don't love his people, Shabbat's not going to be a delight. Okay? Um, Adonai's holy day, his holy day, worth honoring. Then honor it, how? By not doing your usual things, pursuing your interests, or speaking about them. And if you do, You will find delight in Adonai, and I will make you ride on the heights of the land and feed you with the heritage of your ancestor, Yahov, for the mouth of Adonai has spoken. What what else do we read in Isaiah 56? It says, here is what Adonai says. Observe justice. Do what is right, for my salvation is close to coming, my righteousness to being revealed. Happy is the person who does this. Happy can also read blessed. Happy is the person who does this. Does what? Anyone who grasps it firmly. What are we supposed to grasp? who keeps Shabbat and does not profane it and keeps himself from doing any evil. A foreigner joining Adonai should not say, Adonai will separate me from his people. Likewise, the eunuch should not say, I'm only a dried up tree. For here's what Adonai says, as for the eunuchs who keep my Shabbat, who choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant. You you see how all this is coming in? So he says, uh, not to be graphic here, but he says, even someone who cannot bear the sign of the covenant that was given with Abraham, the circumcision, there is a sign that is greater than that. And that is a sign of the heart. And we show that by Shabbat. He says Shabbat is a sign, right? Verse five, we read here, in my house, within my walls, I will give them power, and a name that is a uh, uh, greater than sons and daughters. And I will give him an everlasting name that will not be cut off. And the foreigners who join themselves to Adonai, look at this, to serve him, love the name of Adonai, to be his servants, all who keep Shabbat and do not profane it and hold fast to my covenant. I will bring them into my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all people. You know, you may have heard that end of that. My house of prayer will be called a house of prayer for all people, right? You know, you you hear even Yeshua, right? Flipping tables, right? And he's like, my house will be called a house of prayer for all people. But understand why he was so upset at that. One, it wasn't just that the people were there. They were price gouging, okay? Overcharging for things they should have because they could. Uh, They weren't supposed to, but here's the thing, guys. When people come in on long trips, they couldn't bring what they needed to make their offerings and sacrifices with them. They would buy it. They would make the exchange of money to do what they needed to go get what they needed for worship, to go do that. So that had to be there, right? They needed a place to do that, but the people were not righteous in doing so. So in further, uh, again, what does this have to do? Worship. And they were so because of they were doing that, they were tainting what should have been a holy thing. You know, the worship and the temple for Yahweh. So here we see in in, in Isaiah, he's saying, my house will be called a house of prayer for all people because who's the all people? All of those from all the nations, even the foreigners, the strangers, even the eunuchs, all these people who come to serve Yahweh, to love him, keep covenant 
and honor Shabbat. You ever notice that? That he says, my house will be called a house of prayer for all people and their offerings will be received. It's in the context of keeping his covenant and keeping Shabbat. So are we faithful in that? Even though we want to build the kingdom, we want to do things we should be doing, but you got six days to do what you want to do. Matter of fact, that's part of the commandment. The dual commandment is six days you work, six days you do. But the seventh day is Shabbat. On the, on the Shabbat, you cease from all that. Okay? So this is what we're looking at. As important as it is to prepare the place for Yahweh to dwell, we need to be preparing the place for him to dwell all week long, our hearts. Preparing your heart, preparing yourself as a place for him to dwell every day. And in Shabbat, stop everything else and be with him and focus on him. And let that day be a joy and a delight, right? Okay, guys, that's all we have for you today. I pray that uh, these these teachings have been an encouragement and a challenge to you. And if these are a blessing, then share them, please. Uh, on whatever platform you, you watch or listen, please share them. We want to continue to get the word out there. And if this has been a blessing to you, please consider making a donation to help us keep these going. That enables us to uh, continue with the recording, the editing, and, and, and uploading, and, and servers, posting, all that. It's uh, because you keep it there. All right. So uh, please consider that as well. And uh, until next time, I, I pray that you're blessed and, and that you're a blessing to others around you. Okay. So until next time, blessings and shalom.